Can you see that? Yep, you're back on now. Brilliant. Um, OK, so um, this next session is going to be about the identification of mayfly adults. Um, it's I'm going to I'm going to go through each of the, the, the families. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction and then and go through each of the families. There's a bit of a mix of levels in this. Um, there's some really simple stuff that you can you can identify uh, really easily. And then for some of this piece, I'm just going to I'm going to touch on some of the, the more detailed information that you you can if you really get serious into it, you you'll want to start looking at uh, those features. So there's a bit of a mix here. Um, Hopefully, I will cover most species. Um, I'll also highlight um, some of the changes uh, if, if people have got keys already. Some of the changes that have been made in those keys. Um, so that there are there are a number of keys to to mayflies. Um, the first two that I'm going to show here are the uh, the one on the left is the Freshwater Biological Association's key to adults. That was published in 1983. It is, it's still useful. Um, it doesn't have all the species in it um, now because there's been some found since then. Um, but it's a really good key. It's a really, you know, it, it's it's got, it, it's there's quite a lot of detail in there. So it, it's not not for the faint hearted in some cases because it does go and look at, uh, at quite uh, detailed characters of the of the species, but um, I'll show you some of those features as we go through just now. Um, the one on the right is the May, the Naturalist Handbook on Mayflies, which was written by Janet Harker. Um, it was published in 1991 or 1990. Um, it's a really good, it's a really good introduction to mayflies. It has got some problems with the keys in it, though, and I think uh, there's a update on those uh, issues. I think it used to be on the Riverfly Partnership website. I need to double check that if it's there or not. But if people uh, are, have got that, then they want an update. You know, get in touch, and I can uh, let you have that. Um, it doesn't have all the species in it, and like I say, th there are some issues with the the keys in it. Um, in 2010, Cyril Bennett and I wrote uh, a new guide for the Field Studies Council, um, which at that time covered all the species. It was pictorial, so it was trying to uh, give you something that you could actually do on, on the bank side almost. Um, it was all geared to be done with a times 10 hand lens, you know, something like something like this. Um, whereas the FBA key was, you, you needed a microscope for some of that. Um, so in, in that sense, it's a nice introduction to the, the species, but in some cases it doesn't get you right down to the species. It will give you a, a, a selection of maybe two or three species where you really need to go and look at the FBA key to get the to get the, the final identification. Um, as I've mentioned, some of these species uh, have changed. There have been new species and there's also been some changes to their names. Um, so Amelitis and Opinatus used to be uh, in the Cyphlinuridae, it's now in a separate family, Amelitidae, and Arthropleia congena was in the Heptogenidae, it's now in the Arthropleiidae. So in the old keys, they will have um, them un under those old families. Uh, and then three species that have changed their names, um, changed the genus, is Centroptilum penilatum, is now Procleon penilatum, Ephemera igniter is Certer igniter, and heptagena lateralis is electrogena lateralis. There's another one missing from that slide, actually, which is uh, uh, heptagenia fusco grisia is um, uh, cagaronia fusco grisia. That's um, there. You, as long as you're going by in in certainly in these cases, as long as you're going by the the second part of the name, you'll you'll get the right species um, if you're using the the keys. It's just that they've they've changed their their genus, the the higher fam, the higher order if you like. Um, there's been some additions to the British fauna which um, is quite unusual actually because we've got quite a well studied um, uh, fauna of mayflies and but over the last you know however many years that is we've had six new species which is is quite remarkable really. Um, Canis Priscilla was first found in 1986 in uh, the Wye in Wales and the Froome and Itchen um, so it's fairly widespread in southern England now. You find it pops up every so often. Electrogena affinis, uh, 
and like that is only found in the River Derwent in a very short stretch of the River Derwent, round about Norton on uh, Derwent. Um, it is it was found in 1988, and we've re reconfirmed that recently, so it's still there. It goes from about Rye Mouth down to Kirkham Priory. I think that's right. Um, Canis pseudorivulurum and Canis bescadensis were were the um, the then Institute of Freshwater Ecology did a, a review of Canis in, in the UK and, and discovered these two species lurking in, in amongst um, Canis rivulurum uh, uh, samples. And these, again, Canis, Canis rivul pseudorivulurum is in the same sites as Electrogena affinis, which is quite interesting. And I think it's been recorded a few other places as well. Uh, Canis bescadensis has only been recovered uh, recorded in the River Lug and we've been out back to try and find it and we can't find it so we're not sure if that species still exists or not and um, we need to do a little bit more work on that one and then Betis Atlanticus has uh, was has been here for quite a while um, it was it was masquerading as Betis Rodani um, the large dark olive and then when there was a, a, a study of the of, of the DNA of Betis Rodani they, they discovered that there was this various other different types of uh, uh, DNA were there and one of them matched Betis Atlanticus. So we were able to confirm that with some morphological studies in 2018. And then the newest one last year, um, well, in 2019, a Dutch ecologist was on holiday in Scotland and collected some uh, mayfly nymphs and then took them back in one of his colleagues, Dan Druka, um, identified them and found Syphilinus aestivalis. We didn't know where that uh, had been collected, but n now that we knew that it was in the country, we, we, we suspected there was something odd with some of the, the uh, Syphilinus species that we were getting in the south of England. Andrew Farr had been collecting in the, in the south of England, and we went back and looked at them and looked at other Syphilinus specimens in the museum, and we discovered that Syphilinus aestivalis um, has probably been around since at least the 1970s and uh, is in various, um, it says rivers there, but actually reservoirs. Uh, it seems to like reservoirs and drawdown areas and places where where uh, uh, it can get a head start on things in the, in the spring and then uh, 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 live in the, as an egg in the, 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 the bed of the river, the reservoir, sorry, um, for the rest of the year. So that's the newest um, mayfly to the British list and who knows, we might find something else. Um, maybe next next time I'll be telling you about something different. Um, so I'm going to go through, I'm going to use the FSC key as a base baseline for this. And the FSC key, like I said, is pictorial. It goes through and it gives you various um, choices in a sort of flowchart type uh, uh, format to start with. Um, this is just the introductory pages here. Um, I'm not going to go through these just now because we'll go through it in, in more detail. Uh, and then for each of the families, once you've got your family from those pages, you then get a table which allows you to identify um, down to down to species. Or uh, you see, as I was saying, that you know sometimes you don't get down to species. So for instance, there you've got Betis bucuratus and, and four other Betis that are in that category there. I'll do a little bit, I'll give you a little bit of information about some of those as we go through about how you might be able to identify them. Um, but you would need to use the FBA key for that. OK, so when we're looking at mayflies, there's a couple of things that we need to do to start off with. First is to decide whether it's a male or a female, because sometimes we can't identify males or females or, or vice versa. Um, the, so the males have these um, external genitalia um, so we can see you've got the forceps here oh, i'll use the right screen forceps here which are long three segmented um, appendages at the end of the body and these are the this is the peens here this is the, the actual genitalia here in the female the body's just rounded at the end there there's no there's no additional structures at the end of the body um, the other thing with males and females is that you can tell, uh, certainly in, in the beta day, you can tell because the uh, males have these large 
second eyes. You know, so this is the normal eye here, and this is the turbinate eye that sits above it, and um, which is a large um, uh, expanded eye that they use, as I said earlier, about um, swarm, looking for the female in the swarm. Um, in the female, it's just got the single eye there. We also need to think about whether it's an imago or a sub-imago. Um, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, the, the main thing is the, the transparency of the wings. In the sub-imago on the left there, you can see that they're slightly opaque. Um, the other thing to note, you can maybe just see, is along the edge of the wing, there's little hairs. Um, so that's another key feature of the sub-imago. In the imago, the um, the wings are, are clear, transparent, and they've not got those hairs along the edges there. There's also a difference in the coloration, but um, sometimes the coloration will change over time if you've kept them for a, a long time or, or whatever. And just again, that picture that I showed you in the last presentation, just to show the difference between the sub-imago and the, the imago. On the bottom, the sub-imago is a, a duller, less bright, um, with these opaque wings. Whereas in the Mago, it's, a, it's got crisper colours and it's got these uh, transparent wings. Sometimes you get quite a drastic difference in the in the sub Mago and the, the Imago, and that's quite useful because it helps us with identifying the sub Mago, and that, that goes back to that question about can you identify them from the river? This one, almost certainly yes. Um, if you've got a, a yellow insect coming, a yellow mayfly coming off the river in May, is probably going to be this species here, yet the yellow may done, um, heterogenea sulfurea. You can see that this is this is the female here and it's bright yellow. The male's the same um, in the sub imago stage, it's got these black feet um, and bluish eyes. They do get darker as they as they grow older. Um, the imago is this bronze colour um, with the blue eyes again um, and bronze veins in the wings. Um, it is it's also got banded tails, which is another uh, good point to note there. Uh, again, you can see you can you can see these features on the bank side. Um, just another yellow one, though, just in case. And um, this is the yellow mayfly, Potomathus luteus, which is restricted to the Y. Um, we think is restricted to the Y in the seven and, and possibly the usk. Um, and you can see again, it's got the it's got the yellow. Um, yellow. Uh, wings and yellow coloration and then the the imago is is a much brighter sort of like orangey color with the the bronzy veins in the wings um this brings me on to one thing that to separate these two species if we go back to this one the observant of you will have noticed that this one has got two two tails um and this one has got three tails so how many tails is really important um, this helps us to separate out different families of, of uh, mayfly. And um, as nymphs, they all have three tails, but as adults, some have two tails. And as we can see here in the right hand one, this is the one with the three tails. It's always the middle tail that's missing. If you, if you um, have a, a specimen with two tails, but it looks kind of not symmetrical, so there's one here and there's one there, um, that's probably a three tail one. And if you look closely, you'll probably see the stump of the, the third tail. Uh, in when the when it's truly missing, um, it's it's usually a, there's a tiny little pointed segment here, which uh, is never, never never looks like it's been broken off. And it's very rare. I don't think I've ever seen the middle tail broken off and the outer tails not broken off. Um, so you usually if you've if you've got if you've got the middle tail, then it, it's a three tail uh, mayfly. And just some examples of two tails here in the Siphthoneuridae, um, Heptogenidae and the Betidae. Uh, you can see that, that um, you quite clearly see the, the two tails there. And in the three tails, you've got the Canidae, Ephemeralidae, Leptoflebidae and the Ephemeridae and the Potamanthidae, which isn't on there, we've just seen. Um, the hind wings are important as well. Um, so some people struggle with the hind wings and you need to use a lens to see these. Um, it's, it's just about possible with the naked eye, but it's, it's much easier with a lens and popping them in a little 
um, little sort of like jar like this to have a look at them is is ideal. Um, we've got three different types of hind wing. We've got the obvious hind wings, um, which are roughly about maybe a fifth to a quarter the size of the the fore wing. Um, up here in the left hand corner here, you can see this obvious hind wing here. Um, we've got the tiny hind wings, which come in two sort of different types. We've got the little, tiny little oval slips like this, um, which are, are um, a fraction of the size of the, the, the obvious ones. And we've got these ones here, which are spur shaped, which I'll show you a bit more in detail in a minute. Um, which are just a, a slither of wing membrane, really. These are quite difficult to see sometimes, so you need to be careful that you, you are actually identifying it properly. And then in the Chloion and Procleon, there's there's no hind wing. Um, and again, you need to be just careful that you're not overlooking this little slip here um, when you're doing that. Um, finally, the number of segments in the foot um, can be useful. Uh, it is getting a bit more detailed, but uh, in the beta day, there are three free segments. There's a fuse segment, and then the, the, the segments that actually articulate are the free segments. Um, and these, uh, there's, there's three in the beta day. And you can see here, um, another point is the length of that first segment, that fuse segment is important in identifying uh, Procleon bifidum. The Amelitidae and Cephalinuridae have four free segments. So you can see here articulated there um, and the, the fuse segment there. And then the Arthropleidae and the Heptogenidae have all five segments free there. So just to summarize that little sort of like bit to the families, um, you can summarize that by uh, looking at the hind wings and then the number of tails. <coughs> and that gives you uh, uh, you know, that breaks down what families that you might be looking at. Um, so with hind wings with absent or tiny uh, uh, wings and two tails, you would be in the beta day. You could go straight to that section of the, the, the key. With the obvious uh, hind wings, you need to do a little bit more. Um, just seeing there how you can look at the tarsal segments to split it down to get into the Cyphlinuridae and the Heptogenidae. Um, in the ones with three tails, you need to go and have a look at the wing venation. Um, mayfly wings come in various uh, degrees of wing venation. This is a typical mayfly wing. This is the ephemera danica uh, wing, and these are the, the main veins that are marked on here. Um, this this is getting into a little bit of detail, and you know, you, once you get your, your head around the wing venation, um, it is relatively easy to use. Um, the key things to look for are um, these um, veins down here between the two CU, the cubital veins, um, and this this fork here is is another one there. Um, this one here in the bottom right is um, the it just shows that sometimes you can get really reduced vein um, wing uh, venation. This is in the canidae. Um, you can get like uh, quite reduced. In the beta day, you can get a bit of reduction. Um, it's not it, there's not as many cross veins as in the um, ephemera day um, up here. But one of the things to look at with the beta day is these intercalary veins. These little short, unattached veins that go around the the margin of the the wing. And these are present in um, the beta day and also in the um, ephemerella day. In some species, you only get one, um, a single vein between each of the long veins. In others, you get two. And all the ones with two in the UK are beta species. And so that's one way that you can double check what, what um, genus you're looking at. A couple other wing venation things. Um, so we've got, uh, again, some more intercalary stuff. So we, we talked about the cubital vein before. In the heptogenidae, there are these longer, but still unattached. You can just see that they, they end abruptly. Um, they're not long veins. Um, and there's two pairs of those in the heptogenidae and arthropleidae. In the cyphlinuridae, they've got these wavy 
wing veins down down the, the, the rear half of the the wing, um, which are fairly distinctive when you look at them on, on an insect. And um, in the hind hind wing, um, in the heptagenidae, just to separate out Arthropleidae, if, if you can see this fork in the, you can see these two lines here, um, how it forks. Um, if that's present, then it's heptagenidae. If it's not present, it's Arthropleidae. And finally, my, um, infiltrating our slide on wing venation is a, is a foot. Um, and it, just just to say that in Amelitus, in the Amelitidae, um, Amelitus has um, this this form of uh, claw in the end. It's got a sharp claw and it's got a blunt claw. In the Scythinuridae, um, both claws are sharp like this. A couple other things on wing venation that will will you'll you'll need if you're wanting to. Um, uh, go into into detail on this is just looking at the the shape of some of the the veins just at the base of the wing in the ephemera day and potamanta day there's this arch in the wing that you can see here in the wing venation so instead of coming straight out and going up the up the wing the um arch they, they've got this bend in them in the leptoflebra day and ephemeral day it's it's straight um you can see here and to separate these two you're looking at the how how the uh, the um, the layout of these wing the base of these wing uh, veins and whether they're closer to if they're if they're spread out evenly or whether one's closer to the other we'll see that in a second though the other thing is to note is that all the veins along the edge of the leptoflebidae are, are really complex uh, but as I said earlier the single intercalary veins down the edge of the of the ephemeralidae. <clears throat> so there are some identification issues. Um, so uh, we can't identify all adult mayflies reliably to, to species. And this table just gives you some of those um, issues. We've in the beta day particularly uh, are tricky. Um, and really, we can only with any confidence identify the males of most of the species um, and usually the male Im imagos as well because the the genitalia aren't fully formed in the sub imago stage uh, the exception to that is betis rodani and betis atlanticus which we can't separate uh, reliably but we can tell that it's that pair and i'll show you that in a second um, and the same with those other betis there that it's just the Im imagos that we can do then in the Ectionus, um genus, we there's, there's three of those that are much easier to identify as subimago, but the male imagos can be uh, identified with a little bit of care. Um, there are some variations which you've got to be aware of. So if we go into the beta day, um, we start off with them. They're probably the hardest group people struggle with most. Um, we'll start off with the beta day with no hind wings. Um, so, as I mentioned, you need to be careful that you get the the you, you double check that there is there isn't a tiny slither of a, a hind wing. But um, once you once you're sure of that and you're sure that there's no hind wings, you can actually look at the the wing tip, and you can have a look at the the venation there, and that um, will let you separate Procleon bifidum and the two Chloeon species. Um, in Procleon bifidum, these veins here um, line up. Um, you can see here that the, the cross veins are lined up across that part of the, the wing, whereas in the Chloeon species, they don't line up. They are offset slightly. The other thing, both both um, species have got single in intercalary veins, um, and usually, um, certainly in Procleon bifidum and in Chloeon simile, they've got quite a number of veins in this this area, the peristigma. Um, in Cleon diptrum, there's only a few veins in here. There's not many veins at all. Uh, but Cleon diptrum, certainly the females are really distinctive. Um, they have this bronzy brown um, leading edge to the wing, um, which makes them really distinctive. And, and certainly, you know, when I get specimens in from from moth traps uh, this is one that you can just sign off straight away as as being correct 
Moving on to the ones with the little little slithers, these are the spur wings. Um, <coughs> and we have two species with these, this type of vein, uh, this type of wing, hind wing in, in the UK. Centroptilum luteolum has um, this uh, form here with the pointed end to it. Um, and Procleon penilatum, it's got a rounded end to it. The other thing to note is the way that these insects are sitting. So if you see these ones, these are sitting with their wings quite closed, whereas Procleon penilatum, when it when it sits on the water and when it comes off the water and it's sitting on the bank, it's got its wings open at maybe you know quite quite an angle, um, and it will sit on the top of the water and float downstream, looking like that. So you can tell that one from a distance, um, and and just double check it with the hind wing. Betis wings, um, as I mentioned, they've the, all the Betis species have got these double intercalary veins, um, so they're dead easy to get to that point. Um, in Betis rodani, they have uh, just between this is the, the these are the the wings here, but just between the wings on the thorax, there's these two open little circles. Um, it always almost looks like a little face, you know, with a long nose there and, and these two eyes. And um, these th these little circles are, are unique to, well, I say they're unique to um, Betis rodani and um, Betis atlanticus, although I have found on a single uh, Betis bucuratus, I found this once, um, which was a bit unusual. The um, But th this is a good, only on the subimago though, these disappear when it molts into the imago, so you can identify the subimago at least to, to those two species. Uh, just another thing, um, to look at though is that in the males with these turbinate eyes, the colour of the turbinate eye is actually quite important. You can tell, you can get, you have a good idea about what species you're looking at by the colour of the eye, certainly in the British species, um, because we've got so so few. Um, but yeah, if you've got a bright yellow uh, turbinate eye with, with a hind wing, then it's probably going to be Betis viscatus. Uh, just looking at the hind wings, you can separate out some of the species with the hind wing. Um, this this thing here called the coast, costal process um, is found on most of the wings. You can just see it better in this lower uh, left image, this little pointed process. Um, if there isn't one of those, if it's just smooth right the way across, then it's Betis atrobatinus. Um, that's the only species in the UK that doesn't have that process. Um, in the other species, there are three straight veins. So that's that big group of species there, all have the three straight veins in the, the hind wing. In Betis muticus, there are three veins, but the central one, this, this, the, the, the second vein, is forked. So it, it breaks into two different branches. And in Betis digitatus and Betis niger, um, it, there's, there's only three veins, uh, sorry, two veins. Um, this third vein in Betis muticus can be quite difficult to see, but if you get the right the lighting correct, it'll it'll pop out. You'll see it no problem at all. It is very close to the edge of the the wing though. So this is the bit that I, I um, was saying that this is not in the FSC key. This is this is in the FBA key. Um, if you want to identify Betis down to species, you're probably going to have to find a male and your uh, beta samagos anyway, if, uh, down to, to species, you're going to have to find a male and have a look at the genitalia. And it's you, you're actually looking at the forceps. So these appendages that, that come out from underneath the tails and you're looking at various differences in them. I'm not going to go through this, but we're basically looking at, at restrictions and swellings and bumps and teeth and the like. And the FEA key um, sets this out really well. So that's the Betidae. Um, if we move on to the Canidae, the Canidae are the smallest of the British species. They, uh, they range in size from about three millimetres to nine millimetres, <coughs> which is, makes them challenging. Um, the, the common name is the Angler's Curse because, uh, because they come off in huge numbers and the fish kind of get, uh, and it's difficult to catch fish in those hatches. Um, the first thing that we need to look at is to separate the two genera. There's um, two 
two genera in this this group, the Brachycercus and Canis, and they're relatively easy to separate. If you look at the underside of the 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 adult and look between the middle legs in Brachycercus, it's quite wide apart and uh, and um, has this sort of like broad sort of like plate across here, whereas in the Canis, it's got this pointed sort of intercoxal process. Um, so that, that means that the backs, the, the ends of the legs are quite close together, whereas the in bracket surface they're, they're far apart. <coughs> the um, Now where it gets tricky with these ones is that you need to have a look and look on the, the second abdominal segment um, for a spine. And this is this is an uh, uh, impression of what that spine looks like. It's quite difficult to photograph. Um, but there's a single spine that sticks up from the, the second um, abdominal body segment, uh, which, um, yeah, if you if you see that, then that is most of this. Most of the species have that, but there's two that don't, which is Canis luctuosa and Canis macrura. And the way to separate them is to look at the um, the easiest way to separate them is to look at the antennae and the the, the, the whippy part, the, this, the long thin part, the flagellum is widened out and, and sort of like uh, tapers off in Canis luctuosa where it's it's slightly tapered but much more uh, uh, thinner in Canis macrura. And then as with the betas, if you if you want to identify these two species, you're going to have to look at the, the, the genitalia. <clears throat> which are uh, initially you, 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 they fill you with horror, but they're actually really quite distinctive. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, they have these uh, plates and 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 dips in them. And then the, the forceps, the length of the forceps and the shape of the forceps is important as well. Moving on to the ephemeralidae, um, there's only two species, and fortunately they're relatively easy to separate. Um, in the ephemeral and notata, if you turn them upside down and have a look at the, the underside of the abdomen, there's a, a series of lines, these black lines and, and dots on there which are really distinctive. They're on a, a pale background and they're, they're dark markings. One thing to note, though, is in some rivers, particularly the chalk streams, you sometimes get serotella ignited, the other species, with a, a, a very faint pattern like that. And, and I think it's because the background colour usually masks, masks it out. Because they're in a, a, a lighter um, background as a nymph, sometimes you'll see these coming through. Um, in the adult, but um, usually it's really distinctive. It's, it's very strong black markings. <coughs> the other thing you can look at their genitalia, um, and they're they're quite different there. You can see that there's a large notch in the in the penis lobes of the of ephemeral and atata, whereas it's more rounded in and, and U shaped in serotella ignita. So the three species of ephemer ephemeridae that we've got in the UK, um, these are our largest mayflies, they're up to 25 millimetres. Um, and they're relatively easy to identify on the basis of their um, their body markings on the upper surface of the body marking. So if you're looking from above, looking down onto them, you can see um, the, the different markings. So here, here's an example here um, <coughs> of ephemera. Danica there, um, the last three segments are quite heavily marked, um, whereas the other segments are, are, are very lightly marked. Um, and in fact, the the first these these markings here are sometimes absent altogether. Um, so that's quite distinctive. They're usually long, oblong, sort of sausage-shaped markings. <coughs> whereas in ephemera vulgata, they're more triangular. This is quite elongated. Sometimes you get them quite um, shortened, and these markings go right the way up. So you, I've never seen a vulgata without these markings on the, this segment. So that that's quite obvious. And then the the last species of ephemera lineata, which, um, as its name suggests, has got lines, 
and, and the, this has got a much finer markings on it um, and there's a series of lines on each segment. Um, really quite distinctive this one as well. It just seems a lot, lot finer, a lot more delicate than the other two. You can, uh, again, the genitalia are there just for, for information, um, you, but the body markings will be sufficient to identify these in most cases. Heterogeneity is the other big group in in the mayflies, and these range in size. You know, they can be uh, as small as eight millimeters up to about fifteen to seventeen millimeters, um, depending on the species. Um, they are relatively easy to identify in the subimago stage. They're a bit more tricky to do in the imago stage. Um, start off with the genera. Um, so there's five genera, there's four on this slide here, and I'll show you the other one separately. Rithogena are dead easy to do because they've got this, every femur has got this dark mark on them. If you see that, you know straight away it's Rithogena. Um, very distinctive, it's on the nymph as well, so again, you can do that with the, the nymph. In Ectionus, you can see it doesn't have that dark mark on its um, femur, but it does have these diagonal dark markings on each of the body segments. Um, these are usually quite obvious as well. Electrogena we met back in the other presentation as the yellow, uh, dusky yellow streak with this orange streak down its side uh, and below the wings here. Uh, Electrogena affinis, which is the other species, um, has an orange, it's a bit more orange, but it still has that very contrasted um, streak down the, below the wings. Um, and heterogenea, the, the two heterogenea species are both bright yellow. Um, one is thought to be extinct in the UK, uh, but the, the, the separating features are the, just here, the, these dots on the, um, on the um, thorax and then the genitalia. So these are, uh, that's for them. The other one is Cagaronia fusca grisia, which is a relatively restricted species. It's found all over Ireland, um, but it's mostly found in the Fries and Galloway in Scotland and bizarrely in the Reading area uh, of England uh, and, and a couple of other sites in between. So it's in, in the Derwent in, in Yorkshire as well. It's got a really strange distribution. The, the key feature for this is that it doesn't have the other features that the other, other genera have, but it does have this uh, these flesh-coloured bands on the femur. Um, they look a bit like armbands, if you like, and uh, they're, they're quite distinctive. Um, often you, you'll be scratching your head thinking, what on earth is this? And then suddenly you realise it's got this band on it. It's like that. It's obvious what it is. Um, the genitalia are quite different, and we can separate them out into two different groups. Um, we've got the groups that have on the forceps base, this area here, the ones that have no teeth, so you know it's just smooth across here, and then the ones that have got these bumps or teeth here. And yeah, um, most of the genres have these these teeth. Um, there's there's uh, uh, well, half of them have them, half of them don't. So, they, and they're quite variable in the egg genres, and that that's one of the things that Janet Harker mentions in her book that um, depending on how the specimen is is living or has died, um, can be the the shape of the genitalia can be uh, can differ. Um, so, it is one to keep an eye on and, and be careful with. That's why the subimago is much easier because, as we'll see, the wings are are quite distinctive. But the shape of the, the, the penis lobes are quite distinctive as well. You've got Rithogena with these long, thin, sausage-like lobes. You've got these ones uh, here, which are flattened and, and sort of like um, smooth and, and, and uh, scalloped at the edges. You've got the heart-shaped um, penis lobes of Electrogena and the T-shaped lobes of Ectionus. And these ones, which I always think look like my dog's ears, um, uh, are, are sort of like slightly extended versions of the heterogenea ones in Cag Cagaronia. 
Um, Rithogena, the two species, Rithogena semicolorata on the left and Rithogena germanica on the right, the March brown on the right and, and olive upright on the left. Um, these are these are quite different. Um, they come out at different times of year, slightly different times of year. The March brown is out in March, April just now, um, whereas the olive upright is a bit later. Um, there's a difference in size. The March brown is much bigger. Um, it gets up to about 13, 14, maybe 15 millimetres, um, whereas the olive upright is really over 10 millimetres. The olive upright has plain grey wings, whereas the March brown has got these mottled wings. And the genitalia are slightly different as well. The, the March brown are, are simple, um, simple penis lobes, whereas the uh, in semicolorata it's got this hooked sort of like bill or beak on it. The Echionis uh, subamagos, you can see here, they've got um, quite distinctive wings. Um, we'll come on to the large green done in a minute um, because it's a much easier way to identify it rather than the wings. Uh, the autumn done at Gionis Dispar has got plain wings with dark uh, veins. The large brook done, so sorry, I'll do the late March brown, has has coloured wings and the, there's a bit of colouring around all the veins. So it's not the vein is coloured, there's also the, the membrane round about it is slightly coloured as well. And that's on all the veins. Whereas in the large brook down at Gionis Tarentis, it's only on some of the veins. So you get these banded patterns across it. You also got this yellowish um, pattern, the yellowish colouring up the the, fore, the the leading edge of the forewing. Roughly, they're all about the same size. The, the autumn done is a bit smaller, um, but they're all within the 10 to 15 millimetre size. And there is a, quite a difference in the size of the males and the females. Uh, the genitalia, we've got the two species, the large brook done and the autumn done, that have got the teeth on their forceps base and the other two don't. Um, the green done, uh, Ecgionus in sickness, as I said earlier, is a much easier way of identifying them. It's got this really distinctive patterning on the underside. Um, so it, it can be separated out quite quickly. It's around in May, um, potentially into the start of June. Um, it's quite a localised distribution, but it's, a, it's an absolutely lovely insect when you see it. Uh, the, the differences between the two, so if you if you use that to identify the egg genus and sickness, the only other one without um, teeth or bumps on its faucet base is the egg genus venosus. To separate the two with teeth, um, you're looking at the shape of the the penis lobes and you can see that these are quite elongated and, and expanded laterally whereas these ones are much more upright and uh, squarer if you like. Um, moving on to the Leptophlebidae, the Leptophlebidae is a fairly small family, so there's six species in the UK. Um, we start by looking at the hind wing um, and we were looking at a different type of costal process. So we talked about the costal process was the pointed bit on the beta day. In, in the Leptophlebidae, Habrophlebia fusca has got a, a little rounded process. So the, instead of the, the edge of the wing just being straight, it comes to, it, there's this little notch. Um, and once you see that, you, you know you've got Habrophlebia fusca if you're in the Leptophlebidae. You can see there's no costal process in this one here. Um, and that's the other two genera, Leptophlebia and Paraleptophlebia, are like that. Um, in the, the Leptif Paraleptophlebia, we're, we can separate that from um, Leptophlebia by the positioning of the, the veins. I'm not really going to go into that just now because it's a bit, a bit tricky. And, and uh, but basically, we're looking at how how far apart they are. These these three veins here. Um, it's a bit difficult to do with a hand lens. You, you sometimes need to do, as has been done here, is, is take the wing off um, if you've you collected a specimen. But the Paraleptophlebia submarginata is, is there's the, the three species, and Paraleptophlebia is the most distinctive. It looks like a miniature March brown. It's got these patterned wings with a little clear window uh, without any patterning in the, the centre of the wing. It's tiny, um, it's about nine millimetres. Whereas the March Brown is about 15 
uh, millimetres. It's also the uh, Lepta flavidae have three tails, whereas the March brown and the other heterogeneity only have two. Um, again, you can look at the, the, the easiest way is to look at the um, genitalia. The, it, the patterned wings is submarginata, but the two other ones have got plain grey wings, um, but they've got quite different genitalia in the males. Um, you can see that Wernery has got these sort of like very sort of like fancy uh, penis lobes um, and Cincta is, is less fancy. In the Leptoflevia um, species, there's, there's two species, Vespertina and Marginata, and um, at first sight, looking at the um, looking at the subimago, you can tell by the, the the shade of the hind wings. In Vespertina, the hind wings are notably lighter, paler than the the fore wings, whereas in Marginata they're they're all the same shade. Um, and then the other thing is to look at the male genitalia, and you can see here uh, it they've got these sort of like um, ang angled over penis lobes. And the the angle of that is rounded in marginata, and it's got this hooked corner apex in Vespertina. And the final groups are Cyphlinuridae uh, and Amelitidae. Um, we saw earlier on that Amelitus has got those um, dissimilar claws on the feet, um, whereas in Cyphlinurus they're they're both the same. Um, after that, we can look at a couple of things. Um, the genitalia are, are fairly distinctive. They're quite they're quite different between the the, the now four species that we've got, um, and the armatus um, in in Cyphlinurus armatus the uh, the eighth the ninth segment is is really flattened out and 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 produced into these big spines. The other thing is that if you look at the underside of the eighth segment, the one before it, in Armatus it's got this um, returned sort of like in, in, ingrown spine, if you like, um, on, on the underside of the, the body, whereas in Estevelis, our new species, it doesn't have that spine. Um, otherwise, these are fairly uh, Fairly, fairly difficult to identify um, uh, or to separate. Um, the the colouring, the markings on the body are possibly useful to um, identify to separate them. Alternatus has got a, a quite a striking contrast between um, parts of the body, um, but as you can see in Armatus, it can be quite striking as well. This is quite strikingly marked. Um, they they're relatively lacustrous is relatively common. Um, Amatus is incredibly rare. Uh, Estevalis is looking like it's more common. And Alternatus, um, we've found some new sites recently, um, but is relatively rare as well. And that is uh, a real whistle stop to or through mayfly identification. Um, I realise that some of that is, there's, there's quite a lot of detail there, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions or, or give you tips on how to take this forward and um, yeah, any other way. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Thanks, Thanks very, very much. much. Yeah, Craig. Very, very in-depth. In um, um, there are, there are, I'm just going to spotlight you, Craig. There are a couple of questions that have come through already. So I'll start with a question from Nick. He said, mm -hmm. um, brilliant for your static pictures. And uh, you very helpfully answered a question earlier about post hatching flight tendencies. Are there any video links which might broadly help with in flight ID? Um, not that I'm aware of, but it's something that I've toyed with doing in the past. Uh, I'm just not that great a photographer or uh, or a video videographer. Um, it would be good, and there's there are some papers that that talk about flight um, the flight characteristics of these families, um, but nothing. I can't think of any videos. 
OK, um, the next question was, are there any plans to update your 2010 FS, FCS uh, FSC key? Yeah, so uh, I would like to do that. I'm finishing off the Stonefly key for the FBA and then I have said that we will do an update to their F, their their adult key as well. So it's um, I would like to add the, the two species that are new to the UK since the FSC key, but we might add that just as a an insert, as it were, just now, um, and then get round to doing it <coughs> more fully in the future. OK. That's great. Um, I'm just scrolling back through it. The, the, there were no other questions came through while you were talking through that section. I think everybody was listening intently. Uh, but I'll uh, I'll allow a few more minutes to see if anybody else pops up. I am going to share another link to the uh, feedback questionnaire just now in the chat. So um, just a, a gentle reminder if anybody um, before they they leave could fill in the, the questionnaire that only takes about a minute and it will help us to get your feedback. If you've got any specific comments that don't feature within that questionnaire, feel free to email me or Craig directly and we'd be quite happy to to take any uh, suggestions or comments that you might have. Um, Sabira has asked, how are the mouthparts of adult mayflies and what do they feed on? Uh, uh, maybe I didn't mention that in the introduction. Um, they don't actually feed. They don't have any mouthparts. So the 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 only feed as as nymphs and then when they emerge as mouth part uh, as as adults they don't feed at all um, all they're all they're all they're there to do is to carry the eggs and uh sorry um, carry the eggs and uh pass on pass you know to mate basically um so they yeah they don't feed at all And then I see another one there about any tips for collecting adults. Um, yeah, I would, uh, you know, bankside vegetation, sweep through that with a, a net, um, look at bridges and look at, um, often they'll be attracted to bridges and they'll sit on bridges, um, look in spiders' webs, light trap, uh, just, just stand at the river and have a look. And one thing, one thing to note though is that if you're looking at swarming mayflies, and and you see a swarm and you move towards it, they 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 kind of position themselves based on where the bank is. And if you move towards them, you become the bank, and um, so they will move further and further away. So you may need a long handled net if you want to actually catch them over the river, and rather rather than try and sneak up on them because they'll just keep moving away from you. I found that to my peril and got my feet wet in wellies. Um, Dennis has asked, what, what's the size of the Siflonorus chemical? Um, they're quite big. They can be 16, maybe 16, 18 millimetres. You know, so they're, they're relatively chunky um, adults, probably slightly bigger than the Heptogenides. Um, but smaller than the ephemera do. Uh, how much anatomical variation is there in individuals within single species? That's from Simon. Not an awful lot. Um, you can get a bit of variation uh, in within a species, just coloration. <coughs> coloration. Um, Size, you can get a bit of difference in size. Um, so, particularly in species that have more than one generation a year, you tend to see the the, the, the size get smaller in successive generations. Um, you also got a difference in male and female size. Um, and sometimes in, in uh, as you go further up uh, catchment, they, they get smaller as well, depending on, on the species. How many eyes does an adult have? Any oscillate? Um, they have normally one set of eyes, one pair of eyes, but then the males can have a second set. Uh, do the females have oscillate? 
I think they do. I need to. I don't know. I've never looked. It's. Um, I need to check. I'm not sure they do. Certainly, you know, other groups do. So I don't see why mayflies wouldn't. Cool. So, so for others, Ocelli are uh, basic light, light dark um, receptors. They, 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 they just uh, uh, allow an insect to, to determine, you know, very crudely whether it's light or dark. Um, there's no, no, image produced. Some, uh, some very positive comments coming through, Craig, which is great to see another masterclass. Thank you. Um, a question from Benjamin. You, you mentioned that a few of the adult males could not reliably be identified. It would not be particularly useful for anything but specialist identifications, but could internal features such as the genitalia be used to differentiate those species like in Neoperla stoneflies? Yeah, so the possibly um, there's been some work done in Spain looking at uh, micro CT scanning um, mayflies and looking at what those internal structures might be, which is absolutely fascinating. I'll, I'll, I'll try and find the link and, and share it, but uh, uh, you can fly through the abdomen of a of a, a mayfly, um, which is really quite smart. Um, so possibly that there could be some structures in there. Uh, I, I suppose I suppose that's the holy grail of mayfly identification is working out how to identify, how to link up the, the the females to the males, and without rearing them through from the nymphs. And some of the nymphs, you know, some of the nymphs you can't identify categorically to species. So you need, but those are the ones. So for instance, the the ectionerous nymphs in the UK. Are really difficult and 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 not not reliable to to identify them to species. Same with Rithrogena, in fact. Um, but the subamagos are really distinctive, so you can you you know once you've got them as adults, it's fine, uh, and vice versa. You know, so it's yeah, it's difficult. Uh, a comment from Helen James. She said, uh, help, "Helpful comment. I think mayflies have three ocelli." Yeah, it'd be the same as stoneflies. Thanks, Helen. Um, Ainsley has asked, how do mayfly population sizes vary over successive years? Um, there's lots of things that can there's lots of things that can affect mayfly populations. I mean, uh, bad weather affected the the ephemera danica populations in in Ireland. Um, you know, and you, I think you can still see the impact of that they've got a two year life cycle. So um, one of, in one of the years, there was a, a large the, the, in their emergence period, there was a large storm which um, wiped out a lot of the, the adult emergers. And because it's a two year life cycle, you, you can still see that. Um, I think you can still see that uh, pattern where you've got one year which is poorer than the other year sort of things. So and it just goes, it, it's building itself back up. So certainly weather conditions can affect them and pollution can affect them, obviously. Um, more generally, it, it really is about their reproductive success. If there's something that interrupts their reproductive success uh, in a particular year, then that will have a knock on effect for, for sub, uh, subsequent years. Great. Um yeah, just uh, I think I, I think this was a follow on to his previous question. Ainsley's previous question was disregarding pollution and extraordinary events. Um, you need okay. to. Okay. Um, they'll vary. They'll vary to some extent, but um, the 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 main the main impact would be extraordinary events, really. Yeah. Um. It looks like we've covered all the questions there, Craig, unless uh, anybody else comes in with anything else. Um, I've just shared another couple of links there. One of them is to the events page of the Bug Life website. We do have a couple of events coming up in the next month or so. Um, so if you'd be interested in getting yourselves booked on to anything that's up there, then feel free to. Um, also a link to the Bug Life YouTube channel again, 
Um, I already mentioned that, uh, that this presentation has been recorded, so uh, we are going to be featuring it on the Bug Life YouTube channel uh, and it should be live by tomorrow. Well, hopefully later today, but certainly by tomorrow. So uh, yeah, look, look out for that if you want to watch back or refer back to anything that Craig has um, mentioned in his workshop today. Um, lots more uh, positive comments coming back. A couple more questions, Craig. Um, Emma has asked, are there any new species from mainland Europe likely to turn up in the UK because of climate change? Hmm. Mm. Maybe, maybe they're already here. Um, the there's certainly some species that might be might turn up. So there's um I've I've often wondered whether there's another Habrophlebia species in the UK. Um partly because the key doesn't the key just says if it looks like this, it, it's that. Um because there's only one species in that genus. But um if you look at the distributions, there's quite a strong population along the the south coast of England. I just wonder whether that's a European species that's just hiding there. <coughs> um, I think we've had a new, we've had a new, um, well, we've we've found a, a stonefly species in the south of England, which um, originated from France. Uh, so I don't see why we might not get some mayflies. And potentially from Scandinavia as well, coming south, but that, that'd be a bit more unusual. Um, another question here, uh, is mayfly diversity and abundance a useful measure of water quality? Yes, um, so may, uh, all the river flies are, are useful indicators of water quality um, and other, other factors in the river as well. Um, mayflies generally like uh, good, clean, fast flowing rivers. Um, they accept that as, as some of the beta day, which can live in quite poor rivers. Um, but the proportion of different species is, is quite useful. So um, heptogenidae uh, are, are really clean you know, or fast flowing oxygenated rivers they need. Um, whereas if you get some of the beta day in large numbers, if, if say your your sample was completely dominated by Betis Rodani, um, there's something wrong there. You should yeah. be getting a nice uh, distribution of different species, and not dominated by a single species. Great. Well, Craig, thank you very much for an informative presentation. Again, I uh, I really enjoyed it for sure, and as I have done the rest of uh, the presentations that you've given, um, they are all available through the YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to refer back to them, then please feel free to do that. Um, and internal anatomy of mayfly adults. Yeah, that's the link to that um, CT scan video. If right. people want to have a look at that. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. It's like going through a, an aircraft fuselage, but it's actually a mayfly. Cool. I'll have a look at that. Mm. Um, yeah, so you, you also featured your email address in that presentation. If anybody does have any further questions, then they should feel free to get in touch with you, or I'd be happy to um, pass on any questions that anybody has to Craig as well, if you want to. Um, uh, pass them on to me. There's Craig e Craig's email in the in the conversation box there as well. So um, excellent. Thank you all as well for attending um, this morning's workshop. We we had quite a lot of you on board at one point. So it's uh, it's great that that so many people have taken an interest in in this and all the other workshops that we've been organising over the winter months. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'll uh, I'll stop the recording and wish you all uh, a fine day. And uh, thank you very much for coming.